We've talked a lot about e-commerce through the morning. And both e-commerce and omnichannel retail are not just changing the way consumers buy, they're changing the way stores operate. You need to match customers' needs with the right products, multiple offline and online locations, and it's forcing a rejig of the traditional inventory approach. When customers demand seamless shopping experiences, as we talked about this morning, distribution strategies demand a melding of physical stores with online delivery systems. So in the future, will brick and mortar stores also need to function as fulfillment centers for pickup and shipping? We saw visuals of that on the screen during Michael's presentation. Is that going to be a reality uh, sooner than we expect? Can those physical stores work with minimal inventory and operate as the back-end logistics centers for omnichannel retailing? We talked this morning about the always connected consumer. These are people who are impatient, they're unforgiving. They're always looking for products and services to be available anytime, anywhere. Stock out is really not an option anymore. If a customer enters a Louis Vuitton or a high design store, as Michael did with the intention of purchasing a certain type of bag, it has to be available there and then in the color that he wanted. Similarly, if they place an order online for the latest iPhone, they expect to receive it the very next day. So in order to match these expectations, retailers and e-tailers have to ensure a seamless connection between all points, from inventory to transportation, packaging, delivery, storage facilities, stocking, as well as communication with all the retail touch points. We're lucky this afternoon. We have logistic experts who are going to share their experiences and challenges with us. So as we did this morning, I'm going to take this microphone and walk around and get you guys to all introduce yourselves, tell us a little about you, and explain why, after that rather heavy lunch, we shouldn't be back up in our room snoring instead of listening to you. How's that? So let me come around. I'm Muhammad Shwe Wahai. I'm a director of supply chain and logistics, uh, working in the Majid Al Futim fashions and uh, handling all the supply chain related things. Also, we are handling means L and E, and uh, it's a leisure entertainment part of uh, Majid Al Futim, as well as Carrefour. So it's a mixture of uh, uh, what you call experience. It's uh, <coughs> fast food, F FMCG. We have Carrefour, we have a fashion, high-end fashions, and as well as the l &E furniture, fixtures, and other things. So that's what we are handling. Thanks. Hello, everybody. My name is Martin Jan de Witt. I work with SAP. Um, I'm an industry advisor for SAP, um, specifically around the retail industry where I've worked for the last 20 years. Um, and I think to answer your question is why everybody shouldn't be falling asleep right now is I think we're gonna talk about a very important topic. Um, and that is that if you if you think about the retail industry at the moment, and, and we've all talked about it the whole morning, there, there is this massive thing going on about how customers are more aware, et cetera, et cetera, and how their expectation towards a, a shopping experience is gonna differ. Uh, a lot of the delivery out of that sort of expectation um, needs to come out of the supply chain. So how does that impact it is, is I think, the topic of, 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 of the moment. And uh, a lot of that is going to be discussed here, I think. So looking forward to it. Perfect. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Shailene Shukla from Jumbo Electronics. I'm head of supply chain and distribution. And uh, to be very frank, you know, the product differentiation is going away. Everyone is selling the same clothes, the same food, the same TVs. So in today's world, uh, probably logistics has become the main differentiator between uh, you and me. So that's why I think you need to listen to us and you know how logistics can made, make a difference to your retail uh, channel wherever you are. Thank you, Rohan. Afternoon, everyone. Uh, Rohan Bardoj. I'm a partner and general manager of uh, Radix Wears. So. <laughs> We're an e-fashion brand. Uh, we're fairly new in the game. We've been less than six months in operation. Uh, and we're quickly discovering about logistics. 
Um, we, we have two verticals. We have the leather division and we have the apparel division. Uh, we are on Souk and a couple of other e-commerce platforms as well. And, uh, you know, we are excited to be here and uh, look forward to an entertaining session, uh, which uh, Tapan will help drive. Thanks. Hi, Sarah Jones, uh, founder and CEO of Mini Exchange, which is the Middle East's um, online marketplace for everything mums and kids. So we actually operate a drop ship model, so items go directly from supplier to buyer. Um, and we you know, are a tech platform that sits in the middle and facilitates that process. So for us, logistics is pretty crucial to get that right um, you know, with items not actually pass passing through our own fingers to make sure the customers get the right things, to make sure they get there on time. Hi everyone, my name is Nisha and I run a brand called The Urban Yogi. We are a sustainable home deco brand dealing with vintage furniture and apparel and lifestyle accessories from all over the world, which means we source from all over the world. Um, logistics is a big part of my business. I'm not an expert. I learn every single day. There are things that change and it's going to be a very interesting session over here today. Hello, my name is uh, Mahmoud Adham. I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Munchbox, uh, which is a healthy snacks delivery service. We've been in business for 13 years now, and the reason we shouldn't fall asleep is uh, logistics is becoming increasingly more important in, uh, in the world where we, live, we live in, where every customer wants to customize their own uh, item. They want it to be delivered now, now, now. Otherwise, uh, you're not in the game anymore. So looking forward to it. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I am Sajan. I'm general manager for Tables Food Company, which is the F&B vertical of Lulu Group. We have a fairly young business, but with an exponential growth plans. Um, why is it important that we need to talk about logistics uh, and supply chain? Now, food is the pillars that every society is built on, and the food is so important for the f health and the well-being of every society. Now, if there is a, if there is a breakdown in the supply, of food, then there are disturbances. So it's important that supply chain, the producers and manufacturers and the, and the retailers work together, make sure that people get what they want in daily, their daily lives. Hi, my name is Mark Lack and I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Géant across the Middle East. Um, I, I like availability. And I like this logistics topic because it's an input rather than an output. We tend in our retail business to only look at the outputs of sales and profitability, but actually when we start to look at supply chain and logistics, these are the inputs to enable the outputs. Perfect, thank you. And the moderator for this afternoon uh, really doesn't need very much, uh, very much introduction in this room. But he's the man who's brought concepts like Papa John's Pizza, Chili's, Jamie's Italian, Thai Express, Outback Steakhouse, Romano's Grill, Burger King, Dairy Queen, and a whole bunch more. So would you please join me in welcoming to the microphone so I can take a break now. Up and right there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anish. Thank you very much indeed. Um, good afternoon, ladies and uh, gentlemen. Not the best time in the day, of course, <coughs> right after a lovely lunch, but uh, our speakers and I are going to do our best to keep you from snoozing. Let's see how far we succeed in our mission. Logistics always was, is, and I believe we can agree with, uh, you know, uh, we can reasonably agree that it will always remain a fascinating aspect of commerce. We only need to look at its history to understand how logistics evolved, how it has evolved over time. Let me take you back to 2700 BC. That was when the Great Pyramid of Giza was built. 146 meters high, 6 million tons in weight, the Egyptians needed sophisticated material transport equipment capable of moving 
those massive building blocks and putting them into place. Even today, we still cannot fully explain how this level of, this level of precision was achieved using the hoisting equipment and means of transport available at the time, 2700 before Christ. Christ. So let's quickly fast forward to 300 BC. And I have a question for the audience and the speakers, if they will. The question is, and the right answer gets a family feast by Papa John's. Thank you, Papa John's. <laughs> Which revolutionary invention around 300 BC provided a strong thirst to logistics at the time? Who would like to answer this? Yes, I will read out the question again. Which revolutionary invention around 300 BC provided a strong thirst to logistics at the time? 300 BC. Sorry? No, that is not the right answer. Sorry. 300 BC had wheels, lots of wheels. Yes. I don't know what he said, but... He the said wheel? wheels. Ah, uh, that's what I was going to say. The wheel. No. Well, we will give it to you. It was the Greek who invented rowing boats at the time. 300 BC, rowing boats. And this invention created the basis for rapid travel across the high seas. The invention formed the foundation for the creation of enormous logistic supply systems required by essentially mobile army camps at the time. <coughs> Using these capacities, Alexander the Great undertook campaigns with his troops, their families, and their weapons of war, and extended all the way to India. So uh, we will give this to you, a family feast from Papa John's. There you go. Thank you very much, Pastor mm -hmm. John. In addition to this, uh, the historical evolution of uh, logistics, we have certain discussion points. So we will get on to the first one. And this topic is engineering a supply chain to meet exact customer demands. Above all, ensuring product availability, as Mark said. And we will start with Mark. Yeah, I mean, from the availability perspective, um, <clears throat> what we notice in this market is that we have to bring quite a lot of products into the market. So availability is always a strong problem for everyone. Uh, right now in our business, we are measuring uh, three countries, 45 stores, 40,000 different product lines across all of those stores on a daily basis, which means that we're tracking about half a million data points because then we actually measure availability in 12 different dimensions to make sure that we actually have the product on the shelf when the customer requires it. Most of my last year that I've been here has been spent trying to explain to people actually what availability is and what it means to a customer because we tend as an organization and as retailers, as I said earlier, to look at the outputs how much sales have we done, how is that category doing, how is this category doing, rather than the input and how we actually put the product on the shelf. So it's not just about measuring is the product in or out of stock, we're also measuring things like potential out of stock. Because we know how many products we sell on a particular time scale, it means we can measure what stock we've got versus what stock will be out of stock before we actually get the next delivery. Even then, when we've got the product in stock, we start to look at phantom stock. So we even measure if a stock is in stock, has it sold its normal sales during that given time period to make sure that it's made its way from the back room actually onto the shelf itself. And then finally, we also measure how much money we lose every day based upon being out of stock. Great, fascinating. Mahmoud, would you like to take this further? 
Mark has shared his experience with the Geons, which is truly a giant. Uh, I will share uh, my perspective as a startup. Uh, where uh, we've been a year in business and we have uh, only 44 SKUs uh, and 42 outlets that we distribute to. Uh, after, uh, after a while of operating in the market, it's very important for us to, uh, as Mark said, predict what will be out of stock next. So we need to develop an understanding of which outlets consume what kind of snacks and why. So for example, in the cinemas, people tend to consume more of the chocolatey snacks for some reason, uh, while in gyms, people consume more of the high protein snacks. And once you have this kind of understanding, you are able to predict which outlets need what kind of snacks ahead of time and avoid expiries and returns from the market and so on. So the point I wanna say is getting the consumer insight helps you manage your logistics in a better way. Thanks. Oh, absolutely. Uh, we will uh, have some comments from Dr. Muhammad. Yeah, means uh, I will add in that one in fashion business. You know, I mean we are currently running. I mean around eighty thousand static SKUs. So if eighty thousand means, and you can see, I mean it's like a dynamic. Every month you need to change it. Every month you have a new collection, and you need to bring it on time. And there you cannot means plan it. It's like I mean hundred percent planning or just in time planning sort of a thing that you will bring, and uh, that uh, hundred uh, units you bring it, and hundred units you will sell it. So their forecasting is, and the planning is the most important thing, and there you need to have a buffer or a tolerance in it. Otherwise, it will be like means you order 100, you sold 100, and then you have nothing for to sell again. So the planning is more important than the shipping part and then the logistical part, and the, the toughest part in the fashion business. Is you are ordering like I mean, six to eight months before, and you don't know when you are going to sell it. You know, six, eight months before you means ordered it, it will come, you, it will arrive and then all of a sudden something happened. Means instead of a winter, the, you know, the summer, means summer didn't went and winter didn't start. It's still heat, you cannot sell it. Uh, you have a means uh, inventory still there. So these all things you need to be very, very careful on it. Means how you are planning it, what SQs you are going to do it, what sort of a means detailed sort of analysis you need to do it. But buffer is most important thing the tolerance level and the means how you will control your inventory. Aging is a big problem in this part of the world, means especially means if something happened, then you have a means you need to face the means inventory aging. Then reverse logistics part, then other things means will have started. So we need to be means very, very analytic in there. Thank you. May I request Anish to introduce uh, Joy, who's just joined us. So the downside, Joy, of coming in late is that you have to give a longer speech introducing yourself. <laughs> Oh, we considered having you going up on stage and doing a song and dance, but... Um, um, being, being late that I am, I, I would deserve that kind of <laughs> humiliation. <laughs> uh, go ahead, just, just introduce yourself, tell the room a little about you, about your company, and then we'll spare you the humiliation. Oh, great. Um, so my name is Joy Ejeloni. Um I'm originally from Silicon Valley, California. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I come from uh, e-commerce. My background is e-commerce. Um, I founded an e-commerce company um, in Silicon Valley called Bonfair. Uh, I was funded from the venture capitalists um, out there. Very proud of that fact, um, due to the fact that of all funding in Silicon Valley, only 2.7% go to women founders. So I'm very proud of that as a Palestinian woman, to note that. Um, some of the problems that I was having with my first company, Bonfair, which was a luxury e-commerce platform was, um, and I'll talk about this later, uh, was reaching this area. Um, anyway, I'll get to that later. But to get to the uh, second part, I founded a second company called Fetcher, which is based here uh, in the Middle East, which is a uh, logistics solution for solving the problem of no addresses in emerging markets um, and how to reach the consumer using technology. So we are trying to deliver all, all packages and empower all deliveries using technology um, and to solve the problem of last mile delivery. And um, that's what we're doing. We're solving the last mile uh, delivery for uh, logistics. So that's a little bit about me. Thank you. Up and back to you. Thanks. So let's uh, briefly go back to the historical aspect. We talked about uh, rowing boats, 300 B uh, BC. Let's now come into Anno Domini, 700 AD. 
Here's another question. Name the monument in Europe constructed around 700 AD that proved superior capabilities in logistics at the time. Name this monument in Europe, 700 AD. Well, I thought uh, there'll be at least some guesses. Sorry? Okay, let's uh, give out a clue. It's in Spain. Sorry? I yes. Where is that? In Andalusia, Cordoba. Yes, that is the right answer. It is the the mosque. It, it is the biggest mosque in Europe, Mesquite. You have won yourself. No, this time it is a lovely family dinner at Jamie's Italian. There you go. Yes. Uh, Construction of this famous uh, Mesquita Mosque in uh, Cordova, Spain, began in 756 AD. Uh, this was part of the Umayyad dynasty, and it's considered to be the largest mosque in Europe. Extraordinary procurement logistics was required to transport the pillars of the mosque, which came from all parts of the Islamic Empire at the time. Okay. Uh, next discussion topic is new approaches to WMS, warehouse management systems, RFID, and other technological innovations. Shailen would like to speak on this, please. Uh, life was very complicated when we had, you know, 20,000, 13,000 SKUs. And, you know, there was a helper who knew the TVs are here, the cameras are here. So that day he is absent, you know, you are totally blank. Nobody knows where the cameras are lying and where the TVs are lying and where the mobile phones are lying. So it was mapped somewhere, but that gentleman in whose mind that location is mapped and the product is mapped, if he's not available, you, you're having a field day. And especially on 31st March, we used to dread the auditors and they would come and say, hey, where's the inventory? We'll say, no, it's here somewhere else, just not that we are not able to find it. Okay, so we, we, we used to have an adventurous seven days trying to do a 100% stock count and, you know, they'll report to the auditors that these guys, you know, they have the inventory but it's lost somewhere in the warehouse and warehouses are very large geographies and so when we graduated to warehouse management system, life suddenly became so comfortable that we could give leave to every helper whenever he wanted and give leave to anybody, you know, who had the products mapped in his mind. So today, sitting on my table, I'm measuring productivity, who's picking how many lines, who's goofing off, you know, doing only 20 lines a day, and who's working very hard doing 200 lines a day, what is lying where. You know, you may not believe we are not in FNB business, but we still have a BBD, best before date. There's an expiry on the product because uh, probably, you know, the electronics items become obsolete very fast. So we track. We track, uh, you know, actual items with expiry date, which we were never able to track. We scan everything because we have probably 25% of the market share of the mobile phones, which we are distributing by numbers. And believe me, all mobile phone boxes look identical. You have color variants, you have memory variants, and you have the smaller version of the same phone, you have a larger version of the same phone. So from three inches to the phablet of say seven inches, I mean, there are one million phone SKUs and, I mean, at any age, not just my age, at any age you cannot read what is written on the box with your bare eyes. You'll need a magnifying glass or a microscope. So now we scan everything. So it's the right product going to the customer at the right time. He's not howling at you. He's not abusing the sales guys. The sales guys are not abusing us. That look, instead of the white iPhone, you send the black one and instead of the 16 GB, you send uh, 64 GB, and we are not losing money. End of the day, we began after implementation of warehouse management system, an audit, 100% audit, which we used to do once in a year, and it used to take us full seven days 
with little bit dis disruption of business. Now we do it on weekends. No closure, we do it on a Friday, so business goes on. People, sales guys don't realize when it happened. Inventory is more accurate, things are not lost. And we do it four times in a year. The first year's uh, inventory shrinkage, the saving in the shrinkage alone, has given us the payback on the money that we invested in the entire racking, the entire Wi-Fi systems, the entire scanners, the entire you know, training of the staff, the cost of the software itself was, I mean, very insignificant compared to the other investments that we did. So net-net, so to say that in today's world, we cannot imagine existing without technologies. And earlier, we were just beginning from, you know, the manual system to the scanning system, and now the world is going ahead by pick to voice, pick by light, you know, where you're not carrying a bulky scanner in your hand, we you just are wearing a headphone, you know, which is guiding you which location to go, which SKU to pick up, what quantities, and which console, you know, staging console you have to take it to. So the hands are free, he can run a bigger trolley, or, you know, the picking is pretty fast, and then you have uh, pick by light, whereby, you know, going a step ahead, you have a light guidance system whereby you own an area, and within that area, whatever it needs to be picked up, you go to that area, and you you know, the light guides you. Going one step ahead, you know, from uh, man to goods, we are now going to goods to man, you know. And I'm uh, very happy to see in UAE itself, we have seen two, three very large operations, which are fairly automated. And uh, I don't know how many of you would have seen Dubai Duty Free, it's one of the finest examples of automation that we have, where you have uh, those small, you know, cubicles carrying these various SKUs, they have probably 50,000 SKUs and automatically they'll come to the picking stations and like what we do, you know, we decide the priority sitting on our table as to which, which SKU needs to be picked first, which SKU needs to be picked later, all those things you're managing. And instead of, you know, running after the shelves, you get more space, you can optimize the spaces by using a VNA, a very narrow aisle and automated uh, <coughs> the picking machines, you know, the forklifts and reach trucks have become obsolete nowadays. Uh, but to be very frank, everyone is not there yet. Like somebody said, you know, the future is there. But everybody is not there, you know. It's like, I still use an iPhone 5. <laughs> so while iPhone 6 has come, I have not reached that future yet. So, I mean, we have seen many organizations where still, you know, we work manually and we are not even there in WMS. So I would say WMS is a good step yeah, especially in retail, I think you should not exist. Uh, think about logistics, WMS has a payback. Uh, the cost of reaching, not reaching the customer in time is pretty huge. And how you can reach him faster, more efficient way, have less shrinkages. All these advantages are so huge that it really, you know, pays to be technologically advanced. And especially in today's world where, you know, as I said earlier, you know, you have everybody selling the same product Logistics is the differentiator, you know, who reaches fast? Are you giving one hour delivery? Are you giving same day delivery? Are you giving the next morning delivery? Instead of, you know, all of your competitors promising three days, four days, seven days, within seven days, you know, a very complicated uh, term, so to say. And next thing I'd uh, like to speak about RFID, you know. RFID is also something we at Jumbo Electronics are actively considering. And uh, probably uh, one of the previous speakers said something about uh, use of RFIDs in uh, apparel is huge benefits. You know, you know the stock stocks are huge. Uh, there could be a one million units or five million units depending on the size and the geography. So the total information is built in. You know how many SKUs are there. You don't need to do a physical audit. You know all the time uh, the RFID is being read, whether it is active or it is passive, and. Uh, for people like us in electronics, this has great benefits. You know, you, you could have a built-in alarm, which goes off if the RFID is not deactivated and uh, checkout happens. Or even for our audit purpose, it's very good because we have very high value inventory. Each SKU is 2,000, 3,000 dirhams. So when you want to do an audit, every single day you can do an audit, you know, by just scanning the reader into your storeroom and you know how much value stocks are there and whether there are any, there are any discrepancies. 
So to sum it up, you know, there's a huge, huge, huge benefit of being there upfront, you know, with the latest technology that is there, and the cost of quality pays back by itself in your business. Great. Okay, and and I must add, iPhone 5 is no problem at all, <laughs> as long as you are updating the iOS, the latest version. All right. So uh, before going to the next uh, discussion point, <coughs> here's another question for the audience. And this time it's from 1500 AD. What was this operation? Pivotal in logistical evolution started in France, Spain, and Vienna, present day Austria, around 1500 AD. What was this operation? And the winner gets a family Thai dinner from Thai Express. This operation started in France, Spain, and Vienna, 1500 AD, and it was a big deal in logistics. Yes? No. This was an operation that started in these places, first of its kind, and obviously something to do with logistics. Yes? Okay, we will see if a better answer comes, otherwise we'll come back to you. He says huge movement of troops across countries. Yeah, so give him the voucher. No, no, it was not about movement of troops, no. But he so far is closer to the answer. But although it is not the answer. Yes? His answer was delivery, transport. Sorry? I think we will give it to you. <coughs> Looks like you like Thai food. Thank you. Uh, yeah, this was the first instance of time definite mail delivery. So, under an agreement with Philip of Burgundy, France on Texas organized the first postal service with strictly defined transit times. Letters were delivered to places such as Paris. Ghent, Spain, and the Imperial Court <coughs> of Vienna. In view of the infrastructure of the times and the political fragmentation created by the array of small principalities in Europe, the mail reached its destination with very little delay. 1500 AD. Thank you. Good answer. Okay, uh, next discussion point, e-commerce. Everyone's talking about e-commerce. E-commerce and omni-channel retail are not just changing the way consumers buy, it is changing the way stores operate. The importance of last mile delivery. Let's start with Joy. Yes, so last mile logistics. Um, not necessarily a pain point in Europe and the United States, but definitely a pain point here. How do you reach this consumer and make the delivery experience as delightful as the shopping experience? How do you do that here in emerging markets when there's no addresses? I think that's something that is what we're addressing at Fetcher and what we're, we're working on addressing. No, I'm sorry. E-commerce is something that has been stagnant in places like the United States and in Europe. And e-commerce is booming in emerging markets in areas like the Middle East and India. And I can tell you from my experience in the States that everybody is looking here for growth. And this is an area that is growing tremendously. And there is a need and a hunger for new products. There's tons of malls opening up everywhere, yet e-commerce is, is booming. And 
everyone makes this, this e-commerce sound very sophisticated and, and, and what is e-commerce and how do we crack it, but e-commerce is nothing more than logistics. How quickly and seamlessly can I get the product in the hands of the consumer and how seamlessly can I get it out when they don't want it? That's the answer and that, that, that is the thing that we are trying to solve at Fetcher. There are no addresses here in emerging markets and I think for e-commerce to boom, you have to solve that last mile logistics. Um, and I can tell you that the American retailers, the European retailers are all coming here in droves, Arabizing their websites uh, to see growth. Um, and it is here. Growth is here and we are booming. E-commerce is booming in areas, like I said, in the Middle East, India, Brazil, all the emerging markets are seeing tremendous growth. Yet they all have the same problem, which is last mile logistics. So I think that's something that needs to be addressed. I think that's something that we do at, at Fetcher um, by using this technology that we have uh, called the Fetcher app, which allows us to use your phone number as your physical address. Um, but I think it's something that you know, needs to be addressed. I, I think it's interesting um, coming here from the United States that shopping here is a difficult experience. Uh, parking your car is difficult. Uh, getting lost on the roads like I just did is difficult. Um, trying on clothes in a dressing room is difficult. You would think that e-commerce would be booming here and it should be booming here because it, you need to make this experience for the consumer. And we've done a lot of statistical data and 92% of our deliveries are all cash on delivery, um, which makes it even more important for you to find the customer as easy as possible. Um, you know, how do you change this behavior um, of this consumer who's used to getting 50 phone calls asking for directions on how do you reach your home? <laughs> how do you change that? And that's something that we're trying to crack at Fetcher. And I think it's an important one for e-commerce to grow um, here in this region. Um, we've done a lot of analytical data. The quicker the consumer gets the product in their hands, the less likely they are to cancel it. Um, even statistical data of one day makes a difference on whether the consumer wants to keep the product or not here in this region of the world. Um, so that's something that we talk about. Um, again, the experience. How do you make this experience with last mile logistics? And I think it's really important for e-commerce to grow in this region. Great. Uh, Mahmoud, would you like to add to this? Uh, I completely share what uh, Joy says because uh, we suffer that in our in our delivery service. Uh, we started off with uh, we started a year ago uh, at Munchbox with uh, a promise of delivering your snacks after two days. Uh, then we've uh, improved our model and we moved to a delivery after one day. And now we're working on uh, delivery in two hours, and the next step is 15 minutes. Now, the, the difference we've seen between the amount of orders uh, and uh, in relation to the amount of delivery time is tremendous. Uh, people do want their items as soon as possible, and that makes a huge difference in, in the demand you get. Uh, the key here is uh, how to differentiate your product at the latest stage possible. Instead of picking it up from the factory and delivering it to the customer, the trick is how can you do that process as close as possible to the delivery point? I think that's where e-commerce will really uh, come to play because it's all uh, shareable on phones, shareable on tablets. The order can be seen by the driver and they can actually uh, create the product uh, on their way to the customer. And I think this is uh, what we are about to crack with the Munchbox and Hopefully, this is what will cause a revolution in the delivery business. Great. Uh, I know, Sarah, you have, to, you have an engagement at 3.30. Why don't you take it from here on e-commerce? So, yeah, as I said earlier, you know, we are operating a model that's slightly different to most businesses out here. We're doing a drop ship model. We're actually working with Fetcher here to do that. Um, and, you know, we believe that it's unbelievably important to, one, give these businesses out here that don't want to invest in... Um, you know, their own e-commerce platforms. They don't want to invest in a digital marketing team. They don't want to invest in, you know, logistics and, you know, dealing with that and setting that whole side up that we actually allow these businesses to go online with, and we facilitate that whole process for them. 
We also think it's very important, obviously, to get these products directly to the customers from the distributors that we work with and be able to get them to them within a day or two, rather than them having to wait or them having to go to the stores to actually purchase these things, finding out they're out of stock and having to come back. And, you know, the thing we really focus on is one, the logistical time frame, but two, also the customer service and making sure that, you know, especially in this region where customer service isn't too hot, um, that, that we can provide that service to them and they can trust us rather than having to go to you know, numerous stores or go to numerous you know, e-commerce websites, they can come to us, know that they can trust us, know they can come back again, and know that they can get a variety of products across all the kind of different mother, baby, and child categories. So for us, you know, logistics is completely key to our business. It's key for us to train the suppliers to pack the right products. It's key for us to be able to get those products directly to the customers within a day or two. Otherwise, you know, with high cash on delivery rates, we're going to have items going back again to suppliers pretty quickly. So, so for us, it's, it's you know, very, very crucial for us, to, for our model. Right. Rohan, would you like to? Well, it's uh, absolutely relevant for me uh, just because uh, I had a cancellation today morning. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, it was because uh, the, the e-commerce uh, platform, or sorry, the the website shall not be named, but it's a very famous website in the region. So our products are on it, and uh, the customer didn't get his um, didn't get his shipment after six days. So um, we had dispatched it within two working days from our end, which again we feel that that's too late. But again, uh, we're working through the processes. We're a six-month-old company. Um, end of the day, uh, logistics, as in, uh, I wouldn't discount it anymore, or I wouldn't put it. Uh, I mean, for us, marketing operations, every function is pertinent, but I think we are quickly realizing uh, with the high cash and delivery, I think you mentioned 92%. From what I've heard, it's upwards of 80%, so I think this is bang on. Um, we, are, we are quickly realizing that, and, and I, as a customer, am, will be unforgiving as well if I, if I don't get my shipment within, I'm expecting same day, but, you know, if it's six days, I'll cancel as well. So we're working through the processes, um, and uh, you know, for us, we, we are realizing as well the hard way. And uh, I think we'll we'll send the customer something good his way for no cost. So that's an added cost on us. So quick word, Shailen. Uh Yeah, coming again to the point that how for our e-commerce venture, you know, uh, supply chain or logistics or the last mile delivery has been a differentiating factor. Is that when we launched our website last year. We thought, you know, everybody is selling the same stuff, and probably we are costlier of the lot. Uh, we can't sell Gray product because we are official distributors of Sony and so many other uh, big brands. So we said, let's let's do something different. So we said, okay. We went to all the websites and thought everybody is doing second day, third day delivery. We decided let's do next day delivery anywhere in UAE. So that was a winning point for us. Second was that. Probably against the uh, cash on delivery model, our model, we said that, okay, every courier told us that, look, be ready for huge number of returns after the 15th, because that is when people run out of cash, and suddenly the return rate uh, shoots up, because the customer says, okay, I have no money, khala, sorry. Okay. So what we did was that we introduced uh, credit card on delivery. You know? So that was another winning point for us. And you'll be very surprised that, you know, a lot of couriers refused to carry our credit card machine because they said, oh, we have 400 couriers, we can't do it. And the third differentiator was uh, click and collect. We found that there are a lot of people who want to order online, they know the product, you know, iPhone 6, nobody wants to touch and feel, they've seen it, they've been there. And there's something, you know, there are so many urgent things, there's a birthday, you know, you forgot your wife's birthday, you know, you need to collect it today. Even if it is next day morning delivery, you can't live with it because, you know, you want to live, you don't want to get killed. So, click and collect also worked a lot for us, you know, where a guy can uh, pay from the convenience of his office and while on his way back, you know, whether he's closer to Dubai mall, you know, we are present in all the malls. So these were three, you know, delivery, I would say, advantages that we had, which have differentiated our e-commerce ventures. And luckily, we are doing very well. And another thing which was that, you know, most of our purchases are prepaid, 100% prepaid. So when people are pre-booking iPhones or people are pre-booking, you know, Samsung Galaxy new models, uh, you'll be surprised that more than 50% of our uh, bookings are prepaid. They are not cash on delivery. So that's something which has, again, got nothing to do with the product per se, but the trust the customer places in you.
Great. So let's ask uh, Nisha now, how small businesses uh, can benefit from logistics companies? Hi again. So I run a really small retail operation, it's called the Urban Yogi, and we source from all over the world. Um, the, you know, the biggest game changers for, for a, you know, an SME in Dubai is social media and the push towards e-commerce. And I would, you know, the reason why I say social media is because we constantly sell over Instagram. I mean, our Instagram account has around 40,000 followers. And, uh, you know, we get requests from Brazil, we get requests from the UK, from Australia, that they wanted a vintage sari chair and they want it now, they want it to be delivered to Brazil. So how does one do that? So I think the biggest challenge that I have as an entrepreneur, as a retail entrepreneur, is, is to make that sale possible. And I am constantly looking for logistics partners who can actually, you know, pick up the chair from our retail store and deliver it. Um, but the challenge is, you know, delivering that chair, the cost of delivering the chair is more expensive than the chair itself. So that is my issue as, as a SME in, in furniture. Um, and if, if there is somebody who would solve that, it would make my life really, really easy and my business really profitable. So um, that's, that's what I'm looking for. You know, I, I completely uh, empathize. Uh, just this morning, I had no alternative but to sign off uh, a performer which had a particular mineral oil coming from Canada to UAE for one of our, you know, pizza dough uh, mixer, $900 worth, and the shipping was $400. There you go. <laughs> if I may, our business is exploding on people selling on social media. It is crazy the amount of shipping we do for people selling on social media. Great, we, you and me can talk. <laughs> uh, it's, it's unbelievable. It's, uh, you know, no website, just, you know, so we're, we're in the process of creating a link where uh, you can just click the button from social media and do a shipping option right there from social media. So we, we, we've created it specifically for you, but I, it's, it's unbelievable. Yes, I mean, from it my is. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. All right, let's uh, go to the next uh, discussion topic, which actually has a presentation from uh, Martin uh, from SAP. Can we have the presentation up on the screen, please? Right, let me, um, let me just stand in the middle. Sorry, I'm going to pass you. Hi, everyone. Hi, Mom. <laughs> All right, so um, they've asked me to put a couple of slides together and to talk a little bit about what logistics uh, means for the world we live in today in retail, right? And I think this is extremely interesting topic, as I was saying just now. I think there's so much happening in the retail industry, and there's so much happening in the industry overall. Um, and logistics is such an important role to play. Um, and and I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about the historic topics that you're... I'm just going to continue on on that a little bit. So um, somewhere towards the end of the 18th century, uh, we had the Industrial Revolution. Right, and we all started to use coal and, and mass production started to come along. Um, and and uh, you know, we, we started to be more efficient in the way we produced. Um, and then I think about 100 years later, we started, uh, or beginning of the 20th century actually, we started seeing Ford and their team model and they made it more affordable to start doing these mass production things. And they started producing really for the masses. And again, a lot of people say that that was sort of the second industrial revolution. Um, now, the company I work for is... Uh, One sec, Martin, can you just take the... Yeah. yeah, better? Very good. So the company I work for is actually a direct result of, let's say, the third industrial revolution, when people started to use automation. SAP invented a, an ERP system, and don't worry, I'm not going to bore you about any of the software that we do, um, but we invented this ERP software and became a big company because of it. What we are seeing now, and I think this is, I think, the story of... of today, and not only just now, but also the, the morning sessions, um, what we see happening now is, I think, the fourth industrial revolutional thing, where we start to understand how to connect everything to everything, how we see consumers being able to connect to information in, in a way that was forever impossible, right? And, and so the op opportunities that we see happening up are, are endless. And I'm excited that you know, we're having these kind of conversations where small startup companies that have, you know, uh, uh, um, unique furniture concept or uh, you know we're doing the last mile of the delivery concept 
that are starting to really ramble on the foundations of some of the big companies. And we see, um, we had this morning, uh, um, our CEO was talking about um, you either, what did he say, you either Uber somebody or you get Ubered. Um, indicating thereby that you know all these small, agile, nimble businesses need to innovate in a real quick way. And I think the supply chain is a key important topic to play there. Now, I wanted to just talk a little bit about three um, things that we see as SAP happening in the retail supply chain that are you know, affecting the way that the retail supply chain works. Um, and I guess I have to press this button. Um, so the first thing is, of course, that there is the last, let's say, five to 10 years, there has this, been this massive growth in the way in which technology in itself has advanced, right? I've just put some things on there. I mean, random buzzwords that you hear a lot about. Um, we've, we've talked a little bit about RFID, or you just mentioned it. Um, what we see in retail a lot are beacons that are, are starting to pop up that are starting to allow us as retailers to identify ourselves with customers, etc. Um, we see uh, stories coming up around drones doing deliveries. Amazon is testing with that. We've even heard some stories here in Dubai. Um, but I think an even bigger game changer is going to be the driverless car. Imagine the driverless cars actually don't need permissions to fly around the place. They can actually, and there are some of the companies in the automotive space are currently already doing some very advanced testing with uh, driverless trucks. This is going to revolutionize a lot of stuff, right? Um, 3D printing. I don't have to tell anybody that that's in the, in, the, in the era where personalization for retail is going to be so massive. 3D printing is going to create a world of opportunities. And perhaps 3D printing of vintage chairs. I don't know. Somebody has to think about how that works. Um, virtual reality, uh, Oculus Rift, these kind of companies. Does it have an impact on the warehouse? I don't know. Augmented reality, though, will. I mean, I, we have a, at the moment a, in SAP currently a, a case running where we are doing a warehouse management with Google Glass uh, thing. So the pick by light example that you were talking about, we actually have the glasses. Then in the glasses, you can see, OK, you need to pick this information, that information. So augmented reality, for those of you who don't know what augmented reality is, is really where we take a picture of what's really happening in the world today, and we um, augment that reality by adding pieces of information to that. So you could use your smartphone for that, but also things like Google Glass and other uh, visual aids. right? Um, so other things are, for example, the stuff that we get big with. We had a, a quick discussion this morning about big data and cloud and how that allows customers that we work with to innovate on new technologies and to build up new ideas around how to get to the customers in real time. And then the last one that I wanted to mention is, is the Internet of Things, because this is a, a very vague term that everybody's sort of misusing, and it's kind of like the, the you know, what are these buzzwords that nobody really knows what it means. Um, but in real simplistic terms, it's about machines talking to machines. And I just wanted to give you a couple of examples of where we see this, uh, this stuff happening. So um, an example would be Zara, right? We all know Zara as um, one of the foundation companies is, uh, for, for developing um, real, what they call fast fashion. We work a lot with, um, um, let's say, Zara's biggest competitor out of Sweden. Um, they do the same thing. Um, what Zara is now really starting to do is to embed a lot of their fashion lines and styles with little chips so that they know exactly where along the supply chain it is in a hope that they can actually move the product forward faster through the supply chain. So faster fashion actually gets a lot faster, really by just having the clothing talking to the supply chain stories. So not really a lot of manual intervention. So just a quick thinking about how far this can go. Right, BMW, um, you know, just mentioned the connected car. They're testing with this. They're doing a lot of work with that. Um, another example would be um, things like a smart fridge. Right, I had a, I read an article uh, the other day about uh, the marketing strategy that Procter and Gamble had in 2009, which was really all about how do I place my products at exactly um, the right times on TV and the right uh, advertising, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, up until that time, they'd done it always like that. In 2009, they started to think about, OK, we now need to start more to interact with customers when we're actually at the product, the point of sale. So how do I get my product on the, on the right level of the shelf? And I think that's going to be a, a thing of the past for a lot of the products, right? You have actually two sides of retail. You have that type of retail where you really have to consciously make a buying decision. Um, so this is when you shop for clothing or maybe for a new iPhone. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, in any case, that's the kind of thing where you really need to study it. But when I buy new washing powder or 
soap, I usually go for the brand that I know, right? So it's repetitive buying, it's replenishment, really. Um, and I think for a lot of the replenishment products, what you see is that things like smart washing machines that automatically indicate to your buying app that you have on your smartphone that that product needs to be replenished and adds it to the shopping list of your local Jeanne supermarket, then that kind of innovations are coming, right? That doesn't mean that it's just about that one washing powder, because obviously Jean's not going to be really happy if you just buy your washing powder there. But if you can actually connect that with um, sort of a collector's thing, then that's a really big thing. Um, we've done a, a, a program with, um, with smart vending machines, where you have a vending machine that doesn't only connect back to the supplier system to tell them exactly when they're going to be empty, etc., but also can read some of the information to forecast what kind of stuff customers will be buying. And that is not just a customer who's standing in front, of the, um, in front of the machine, but can also be somebody who's sitting somewhere else and you can gift these items and get it shipped and delivered. So it's a really interesting concept and a very different way of looking at uh, vending machines. Right, so this is not things that are happening somewhere in the future. This is all stuff that is happening today. And all of these things are gonna revolutionize the way in which supply chains work. Now the second thing that is changing really quickly, and I know I have to move on a little bit, but um, the, thing, the second thing that's changing, and I think we've talked about this at length, not only this morning, but in all the previous sessions of this kind of event, and that is that consumers are changing. Consumer behavior is changing. Everybody's connected, everybody gets the access to information at real time, and everybody knows exactly where to get what. Right, so um, just some stats. Um, you know, everybody's got a mobile phone, everybody's got two. Right, so 84% uh, of the device o uh, owners uh, use their, their things for um, actually for a second screen. I do that when I watch my favorite movie. I very often have my iPad on the couch next to me and I look at IMDb whether I'm gonna like this movie or not. It's a way in which we interact with the world around us. It is a way in which we set the expectation, right? And that's exactly what the point is about what I'm trying to say because a lot of our customers in retail are expecting a certain service, are expecting a certain service delivery. And this is, I think, something was mentioned earlier around this as well. And so, while technology is changing the game, consumers are changing the rules. Because now, all of a sudden, you don't have a customer anymore who just traditionally hopes into your store and you need to just wow him, but you have no idea where this customer may come from. You know, your customer may be coming from Facebook or Instagram or something like that. Your customer may just accidentally stumble upon you while you're going to Times Square Mall, right? Or somewhere else. And so, you don't know. And this is the, this is the, the, the big thing about how technology can help, and this is about how you can actually connect to your customer. So, that is, actually giving the customer, um, and this leads me to my third point, um, that means that all this technology and all these trends in customer behavior are actually leading customers to expect a certain service level from the supply chains of retailers, right? Um, so I'm gonna skip this one in the interest of time, but just out of curiosity, I've got a couple of questions here, and you don't have to answer them out loud, but just think, think them through. Do you, do you really have the ability to say, I've got cross-channel visibility? In other words, I can tell my customer in the store that I can sell it, give him something from another store, or I can see online what my product is available in the store. When you talk about availability of stock, etc., is that really something you can offer? Do you have the ability to say to your customers, you know what, if you order it now online, you can come pick it up in that and that store at 2 o'clock? There's not a lot of retailers in this region that are actually al that are able to say that. I don't know, if, if anyone can do all of these things, you can. I think Jumbo is awesome. Um, so we have done a, a piece of research, uh, a company called Forrester, um, you may have heard of it. 71% um, they said of customers that are, um, uh, that are shopping with, uh, with retailers online expect to see the, um, the inventory in real time. You know? So you need to know what your inventory is, et cetera. A lot of companies don't have that visibility. Um, a lot of customers expect to be able to buy online and just pick it up in the store. And that's not an easy process to do. For those of you who, who don't know how that detail kind of works, it's really hard to do. And returns are even more difficult. 59% of customers say that shipping costs are the biggest consideration. And then the other point at the, at the bottom as well, we talked about how important this availability is. 75% of customers actually say that free, the availability of uh, free expedited shipping is going to change the difference, for, make the difference for them, right? So, 
if you look at services like Amazon Prime, right, which in the US offers now, you can actually pay a little premium and you get all your free shipments everywhere. That's a massive game changer for a lot of companies. And honestly, there's not a lot of companies in the world that can compete with that. Um, we were talking about this earlier, and, and it's maybe, maybe three or four of the big US-based retail chains, the Best Buys, the Walmarts, the Kroger's, those kind of guys. They may have the customer base or the infrastructure uh, available to actually compete with that kind of thing. But I think the biggest advantage that companies here in this region have is that they have the real proximity to the, to the customer. And they therefore can deliver much more easy access to the product, shorter delivery times, etc. So I wanted to leave it at that because I think we had, uh, we had only a couple minutes, but um, I just wanted to give you a bit of a, uh, an idea of where, the, where, where we see a lot of the changes going, right? Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Back to uh, the logistical evolution and the question. Martin already covered the 1800 where you had coal and steam engines, etc. that's out of the way. Now, let's go to the last century. The question is, two events in the first half of last century clearly refined the value of logistics and its role. What were they? Two events in the first half of the last century. Both events were World Wars, and that gets you a family feast at Papa John's. Yeah, well, that's nice. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, the first and the second World War. Military logistics was the vital link in the network that supplied troops with rations, weapons, and equipment. With the onset of World War II, logistics was further refined. As a result, logistics gained an important place in the business world as well. Let's go on to the next discussion point. Mah Mahmoud will uh, talk about this, uh, matching customers' needs with the right products at multiple offline and online locations is forcing a rejig of the traditional inventory approach. Take it away. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to speak from uh, our experience in, in Munchbox, uh, talking about multiple channels offline and online. Uh, when we first started the business, we were uh, purely online. And uh, you had to, we had to use social media and to, to advertise uh, through online channels for people to get to know the product. Now, uh, after a few months, we started introducing retail, where uh, we're present in uh, cinemas and gyms and uh, several supermarkets. Uh, and we've seen a very interesting change in, uh, in the pattern that consumers buy. So uh, first of all, it's given us a lot of free advertising, so opening a new offline channel where your name is seen by the core uh, demographic of the customers that you're targeting uh, makes a huge difference. When you're walking into the cinema and you see Munchbox, you go back home and you order it. It also uh, reduces the barrier to entry or the barrier for discovery. Uh, instead of you seeing a product online and you asking yourself, should I order it, should I not? Will I like it, will I not? If you're uh, out there in the street or in, in one of the venues and you see it within arm's reach, the probability of you trying it is much higher than you needing to go through the online process. Now that you've already tried it, what happens is that people shift to the website and they start customizing their own snacks. Uh, and they become online uh, buyers versus buyers who just try it for the first time in the shop. So the point I, I want to say here is having multiple channels online and offline uh, boosts your online presence and uh, helps uh, the online sales for free, basically. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, and Shailene, would you want to talk about when customers demand seamless shopping experiences? Distribution strategies demand a melding of physical stores with online delivery systems. Yeah, as I said earlier, you know, we were very uh, pleasantly surprised that there's a huge uh, population of customers who want to buy online, but they don't want uh, delivery through a courier. And 
this was where our physical presence on your way to the office on your way to the home or you know wherever you are helped and especially in you know large launch events you know when playstation 4 is being launched or when a new iphone is being launched recently i'll give you the example of launch of iphone 6s in our largest flagship showroom in mall of emirates we had two queues one queue for the guys who wanted to pay and buy the iphone 6 there after 12 o'clock and the other queue was for people who already paid the full amount online and you won't believe me the checkout time on the queue where people had paid online and came to collect was approximately 10 times faster compared to those who stood in queue and i am told by some of the people that you know they were saying why didn't we just pay online and you know just spend a minute in collecting our device rather than you know stand in a queue and you know get your picture clicked for the next day's gulf news that you know this was the guy who bought the first iphone so there's a synergy between your online and the brick and mortar presence which helps us a lot and believe me it can be very tricky because you know somebody ordered something which is present at say dubai mall but not present at mall of emirates and he says i am going to collect it so you know either you do it yourself or if the courier is available you give it to the courier so that you know the product is available at the place where he orders and initially we had thought that you know we'll only allow people to order uh, to collect you know click and collect where the goods are available but later on we thought that let's give them the freedom you know as long as the product is available and we are able to move it he should have the freedom to collect it from wherever he wants and actually people can give multiple options of you know collecting from say either dcc or mcc or you know dubai mall and <coughs> wherever they want so this is a very big synergy that helps us and a lot of time you know people don't take decision immediately you know so it's like especially when buying a large costly product somebody saw an 80 inch tv or a 60 65 inch tv where the product cost is say almost 25000 dirhams and he went to store 1 he went to store 2 store 3 brand 1 brand 2 brand 3 finally we, he went home and family sat together and you know they jointly decided that okay let's buy this yeah so this is the reverse thing you know where he saw the product physically and did his window shopping and you know comparison test he saw the product physically he heard the sound system and then went online and ordered so it works both ways you know people uh, order online and uh, physically collect the product from the store and the reverse you know they see the product physically and then go and order online for a home delivery so there's a big synergy between these two uh, sure but when you talk of this the two queues for iphone I must say that Apple, and I'm an Apple fan, Apple has, they have to get their logistics in order. I, uh, on the day the Apple Watch was uh, launched in the US, I booked it around noon, our time, and delivery was in June. This was in April. So, uh, they just don't make them enough, or do they, they don't estimate correctly? What is it? I'm not sure it's a logistical challenge. Maybe we should ask the marketing guys that is this a strategy to, you know, tactically uh, have some shortage of supplies. But you'll be very surprised that this is the first iPhone launch where nobody ran out of stocks. We had enough stocks and huge number of stocks with all the retailers, whoever it was, and product was feel freely available and you didn't see as many queues as they were earlier. So I believe they are also learning from their uh, previous... Uh, no, 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 I think now launches. consumers are also, once they have iPhone 6, they want to wait for two years and probably go direct to 7 and not going for 6S. So I think all of that is helping uh, people get better. But good. I have uh, two uh, very good questions for the audience now. And we are in the year 1956. And this was arguably the most impactful invention in the world of logistics. 1956, what is it? Yes. Barcode. No, barcode is not the right answer. 1956. 
Even today we can't live without this. It's made a huge difference. Yes? Sorry? No, no, that is not the right answer, I'm afraid. Container is the right answer. Who gave it first? The C container that we know was invented in 1956 of the standard size, 40 feet and 20 feet. You have won yourself a f lovely family dinner at Jamie's Italian. Thank you, Jamie Oliver. Good answer. And this actually is part of twin questions. So the next question is, who invented the container? No. Does anyone know who invented this? Sorry? No. The invention of the sea container changed production conditions for nearly all industries around the world and as a result altered people's consumption habits. Even today, the sea container continues to ensure that harbors gain major contracts, new countries and regions experience commercial booms, markets arise, and products from all parts of the world can be bought and sold at reasonable prices. In this way, the container has significantly contributed to globalization. Who invented, who came up with this sea container idea? I can see many people have Googled him already. <laughs> Malcolm McLean was actually a truck driver when he was young. And he had to wait hours on end while people, the, the trucks in front of him were offloaded. So then he one day came up with the idea of carrying a container that can, a stackable containers that can be put on ships and can be taken around the eastern seaboard of the United States. Malcolm McLean is the right answer and whoever Googled him first gets to eat some Thai food. All right. Let's go to the next uh, topic, which actually is much closer to my heart. Sajan will start that off. Um, pivotal role of logistics and supply chain in the food service industry. Yeah, I mean, uh, without uh, much explanation, uh, we can all see it's, it's, it's very pivotal because let's just look at some of the industry uh, data here. I mean, UA currently have about 11,500 restaurants and this is set to grow to about 14,000 restaurants by 2020. And 75% of the UAE population eat once every weekend. 66% uh, of the population eats out once, uh, one meal every, through, through the week, once a week. The population start, currently started about 9.2 million, set to grow to about 10 plus million by 2018. That's a lot of people that we need to be feeding in, next, in coming years. Now, why this, is, why this is significant and why it's pivotal? Because we are in a country where barely 1% of the GDP is the agri products, which is grown locally, which then means about 80, 85% of food products that we consume in this country has been imported from other parts of the world. Now, this would not have been achieved, not, not have, nor would have this industry grown to this maturity had supply chain and logistics not been in place or matured, uh, not been in place. And being in the restaurant business, um, I mean, I've done restaurants in different parts of the world, and the funny thing is that UAE as a country doesn't generally grow any, produce any food, but this is one of the markets that has, that has the most amount of ease to do business. Though we don't produce anything, but everything's available here. 
other part of the world, even matured economies, you, you go in there, they do have the producers, but having that reached out to a retailer, it's a challenge because those places haven't invested sufficiently into cold chain, uh, warehouse hubs, or rail networks, and so on and so forth. But surprisingly, in UAE, though everything's imported, it's all available. It's so easy to set up a restaurant. I mean, you open the shutter, you, you order the inventories from your Horeca suppliers, and it's all there. And how, all, how also this has helped is, if you look around, the world cuisine is here in UAE. Now, you can't have world cuisine, be it as Italian, Asian, or Indian, or anything, without having the producers. Now, having it all available in UAE without anything being produced here also is a tremendous job that the supply chain and logistic part has been taken care of. And if you look at uh, some of the Michelin star chefs, I mean, they wouldn't cook their most favorite dish unless they get a very specific uh, truffle oil or, or, or a very specific uh, extra virgin olive oil and so on and so forth. They get that here without, in, without any difficulty. So that, again, says the supply chain has played a very significant role in this industry. Uh, the way it has grown and it's going to further evolve. Having said that, given all the brownie point to the supply chain side, there are concerns too for us as an, us, as an operators. One is, of course, the integrity. Uh, we often see that uh, a, a distributor comes in with a sample, it goes through a test, it gets approved, then we actually start getting the deliveries, we actually see a, a discrepancy in the quality. Now, obviously, we can't accept it because we can't do, we can't do that at the cost of our customers because one of the biggest cost head for an F&B operator is the customer acquisition. I mean, obviously, the retail space that we pay for, the ads that we pay for, the discounts that we do, we pay a lot of money to get each customer. So obviously, we can't compromise on the quality. So there, there, is a, there, are, there are integrity issues by the supply side, which need to be sorted out. We also see knee-jerk reactions when there is a news about the bird flu in China or a, or a crop failure in Brazil. I mean, next day you see the prices being uh, revised. Obviously, that bird flu probably have a ripple effect in UAE probably in about three to five months from then, but not the very next day. And, uh, and because obviously UAE has a market, I'm sure every supplier is holding enough power levels to service next three to five months. So there's no reason that they increase prices next day, but obviously they do, they have a field day. And the vis -vis, what they also what also happens is when there is a glut in commodity supplies, we don't see a reversal in prices. The prices stay stagnant. I mean, it's, it's, if you look at now, in 2014-15, there has been sufficient supply of proteins or agri products. But we haven't seen prices reversing. And I mean, what we get to understand is probably there's sort of a price fixing going on between the suppliers. So there isn't anyone protecting us as the operators because one needs to understand we are the most, we, we pay the most second, second most expensive price for any produce on the value chain because after us it's the customers. And we cannot pass on all of this, uh, uh, all of this uh, cost variables to a customer because uh, there is a limit that we can play with the prices. And as, as, as a f &B operator, we don't generally touch our prices for a period of 12 to 18 months but our supply, supplier often would have revised his prices twice. Um, so the, the point is, though we pay at the highest price at the end of the value chain, I mean second highest price before a customer, there isn't much of incentives for us in this. Uh, so that, that's the kind of concern that we see that need to be fixed. Uh, and one other thing that we also, we also felt, which makes sense to speak here because we worked, in, I worked in different uh, GCC countries. The ease to bring producers to the country, I mean, I have to say this, the, the, the statutory bodies in UAE has done a tremendous job in easing the complexity of bringing producers into the country versus many other, few other GCC market, even a country like India, because now we're trying to open our ice cream shops in India and then we are f finding it so difficult to get, it, get the right dairy products in India and we can't simply import it. But having said that, in UAE, I mean, if you pretty much follow the, the halal standards and certification, you can get anything in here. So that's another attraction for, um, for a lot of entrepreneurs to s get into this business because you get the producers, you get the resources, you get the talents, everything is there, readily available on the shop. You set, set up your shop. Um, we also, 
another another point that the supply chain logistics, which, which is I would say, which is very matured in this market, has helped us. Is when you work with a lot of fr franchised uh, businesses, you are tied into certain proprietary products, and um, obviously. When we are in a negotiation stage, we sort of try and figure out what are the kind of pro proprietary products they're going to put on the list, and then we obviously do our homework and go back and tell them, you ne not necessarily need to make this a proprietary product because these are available in UAE. Let's just take that out, out of the list. Because what they will also do is they tie you in that contract, and every, every year they go on increasing 5 to 7% of the price, while you are not allowed to increase your menu prices 7% every year. So. That's another way this business has been helped because the supply chain has made sure most of the so-called proprietary products and sources are available in the, in the UAE off the shelf with various uh, distributors. So you, you necessarily need not to sign all that as part of as a proprietary product in your franchise agreement. So when you negotiate a franchise agreement, be, be careful what you actually agreeing to buy as proprietary product. Just don't agree for everything that you, what they ask you to buy. So that's pretty much it. Mahmoud, you are the other uh, representative of our food service industry here in the panel. Please, take it away. Yeah, so uh, I see that the food industry is uh, much less forgiving when it comes to logistics compared to other industries uh, for three reasons. If you compare it to an iPhone or, or any other item that's being delivered, uh, first of all, it's on the order fulfillment side. Nobody now can live with ordering a pizza and having it delivered after seven days. Maybe with an iPhone you could complain and you won't be a happy customer, but if this happens with your pizza, you're not, you're not in business anymore. Yeah. The, the second factor is uh, when was this item produced? So if the, it, if the iPhone gets delivered to you and it was made three months before, that's okay. But if you order a burger or a pizza, which was made three months before, <laughs> you can only imagine what condition it will arrive in. And thirdly, the, the transport and storage conditions. Uh, food uh, is very sensitive to temperature and to uh, how you're handling it. Uh, unless you're transporting it in a refrigerated van and the people handling it are certified and have medical checks and so on, uh, you cannot do it. Uh, it's, just, it's just dangerous. Uh, so, uh, to wrap it up, uh, I think logistics is extremely important for the food industry because it is a very unforgiving industry. Uh, at the end of the day, you could kill someone. Uh, so, logistics is super important. <laughs> no, no, but I think we can only agree with uh, that uh, perspective. But, you know, going back to what Shailen, you said a little while ago, that um, even your iPhones or TVs, etc., have a sell-by date, although there is no such sell-by date, and the appliance is actually going to continue to function, but it becomes obsolete, which is as good as dead. And I, I take that point. In fact, I think that is even more dangerous because there is no date labeled, while in food uh, service, we actually have labels on every product. So it, it's how you look at it. But uh, yeah, logistics is extremely important. We, um, I mean, See, I, we run this uh, uh, Jamie Oliver's restaurant, and you can imagine he wants what he wants, and we've got to get it. And, uh, and it's got to come in fresh, it, even if it's chilled flown. It has to uh, come in that way. We do Papa John's Pizza, where the founder is so passionate about the pizza sauce, it comes from a particular farm in California, uh, harvested only twice a year because of the soil and the weather, twice a year. The tomatoes go from uh, wine to the can in less than six hours, and those cans then finally come to our restaurants. So we uh, know exactly uh, logistics is extremely important. Without that, in this region, restaurant industry, food service cannot continue to do well. Um, let's, there's one final topic uh, before we go around the table, uh, and it, it's, it's, it's a topic that probably never existed some years ago. Uh, Shailen would talk about it, reverse logistics. Uh, the most neglected aspect of logistics ever is what we are going to talk about. So basically, uh, reverse logistics speaks about, uh, especially with reference to our industry, you know, return of recyclable or usable products and materials into the forward supply chain so as to, you know, extract the maximum value out of it. And uh, 
basically want to recycle or resell whatever, whatever is resellable and extract the maximum value out of the return product. Now, just to throw a figure, the cost of failed deliveries in the UK last year was approximately 971 million pounds. That's huge. Uh, what are the reasons for failures, you know, especially with reference to e-commerce and you know, similar deliveries? You know? So the first failed delivery requires a re-delivery. So the product has to come back. That's a reverse logistics, which very few people consider as re uh, reverse logistics. Uh, failed first delivery, uh, when it gets resolved by the customer coming and collecting, Late deliveries result in uh, you know, order cancellations and reverse logistics. Lost order orders with replacement sent, you know, they are misconnected courier shipments. Uh, and lost orders, you know, we all know, result in uh, loss of goodwill. Uh, any undelivered order which is being resent and resent, you know, as so many people tell us in Saudi, you know, you keep calling, it's a prepaid order. And after three, four, five <laughs> delivery attempts, he says, okay, get lost, I don't want it. So is there an opportunity here, you know, staring at all of us? Again, throwing some more figures. US consumers returned $200 billion worth of goods, which is more than the GDP of 66% of the world's countries. The return rate was 8.12% of total sales on an average for various retailers. And major regulatory agencies like the FDA and the Consumer Product Safety Commission ordered more than 100,000 recalls for various safety reasons. Uh, the return rate in EU is much lower at 6.3%. And uh, again, major reason is recalls. And a 2013 survey found that 60% of the retailers and manufacturers in the EU said reverse logistics was important, but only 13.6% of the companies even track the cost of returns. Nobody even tracks what is the cost of your returns. So talking about reverse logistics, uh, I have personally worked in uh, US companies and you won't believe it, there is so much of emphasis, so much of emphasis on forward logistics that people suddenly forget that there's something called reverse logistics also exists. We will write big ISO manuals on processes and peoples and how things should be done. But probably there's some hidden line somewhere at the bottom of the process manual or the audit manual, you know, that reverse logistics also need to be taken care of. So to cut the argument short that there's a huge cost involved in recalling the product, so our effort should be to make the delivery the first time and make it right. Otherwise, we should have proper systems in all organizations where we track and actually ensure, you know, that everything that comes back and what is recyclable is recycled or whatever has to be disposed, uh, should be disposed in a proper, you know, compliant manner, which uh, is very important for the existing of, existence of certain companies, because, you know, a lot of electronics products, they come back with batteries and other hazardous products, and you just can't dispose it in any which way that you want. You have a lot of legal compliances, and there are a whole, whole lot of companies, you know, I know a, a company in US which does only and only reverse logistics and nothing else. And it's a very large organization. Thank you. All right, thank you for that. Uh, I'd like uh, to ask all speakers if uh, any last word, any final word, final comment, or if you have uh, a story to share from uh, your vast uh, experiences so far, anything interesting that uh, we all would like to hear, please? Well, I was just speaking on the side over here. Um, I've, I've been talking about the American retailers looking to this region of the world. And I can tell you that the U.S. retailers are now offering free shipping internationally. Um, you can take a look at all the websites, Saks Fifth Avenue, Neiman Marcus, even the food delivery, vitamins. It's all free shipping. And I can tell you that um, because I'm from the United States, um, 
these clients are not going, I have relationships with them, they're knocking on my door for last mile delivery because they're having a problem with last mile as well. But I think this is a, 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 scary, a scary thing that's happening because if it's easier for the clients here and cheaper for them to buy the product from the United States or from Europe, this, I can only speak for the US, then that says something. Um, I think we have to make the experience for the shopper as easy as it is to shop in the United States. You know, what you were talking about putting your product for people to try it. I mean, Gap, for example, uh, they're in a situation right now where they're using their stores as showrooms um, because people are buying online. But they make it as simple as possible. I mean, look at Zappos, for example, right? They, 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 be, they built a billion dollar company on shoes. Well, yeah, they, they said, go ahead and buy 10 pairs of shoes because we'll take it all back. You know, they put a sticker in the box and said, you don't like it, just put the sticker on the box. The guy will pick it up and we'll take it back, no problem. They built a billion dollar company on people, you know, betting on the fact that if you've got 10 pairs of shoes in your home, you're likely to keep more than one that you actually wanted. And the stats have proven that. And I think that's something that, you know, we talk about reverse logistics, but we don't talk about returns. It's not easy to return something here in this country. It, it should be easy. It should be, you know, you buy it online, you can return it in the store. Why not? You know, how do you build this customer loyalty? And you do that not just with, you know, the ease of getting the product, but with the ease of, of putting the customer first. And I think what, and, and, and please forgive me, what frustrates me here the most, um, if I ever write a book, if I go back to the States, is that we talk about customer service and customer service and customer service, but we really don't know what that means. We build our employees on servitude, not service. Yes, ma'am, no, sir, yes, ma'am. That's not service. And I think in order for us to grow you know, in, in retail and, and legit, we, we, have to, we have to put the customer first. We have to look at them as a lifelong value. We can't look at them like, well, I'm not gonna give them their money back for this product because I'm not gonna lose 50 dirhams on returning it, the hell with them. Instead of looking at the lifelong dollar value of this, of this consumer, it is so hard to get a customer through the door, yet nobody really thinks about keeping them. And, I, and it's a mentality that's very American, but not very local. Like, it's so hard to get this customer. Why not lose that 50 dirham knowing that they're gonna be happy and spend 10,000 more dirhams in your store? Make them happy. And I think that's a mentality that is not embedded in the DNA here, and, and I'm trying to change it, and it's very hard because it's changing behavior, and changing behavior is probably the hardest thing that I can say in my company that I've, I've, I've been trying to do, is changing behavior. But I think we have to look at the customers. I think, you know, everyone talks about retail and logistics, but nobody talks about the customer. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's the most important thing, and, um, I, I think we should, you know, as I started off with, you know, let the customer return it. Let them order 20. Let them return it. Um, you know, put them first. And I just would love to see more of that mentality. That's, that's you no, know, I think you make uh, some excellent points. Uh, I'm a big Zappo fan. And uh, I remember once I was in the U.S., I had to buy a pair of shoes. And I knew the brand. I knew what I wanted. I went to their shop. They didn't have it. And I was in trouble, as it were. But I went to Zappo, they had exactly the same thing and exactly the same price next day at my hotel. So they took care of me, period. The other thing you talked about was servitude and sir and madam, spot on. I, that is not what's going to drive your business. And it's not service. Absolutely. I mean, nothing frustrates me more than I ask a question to somebody on the phone uh, and saying, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Can you help me? Oh, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. I think we're, you know, penny wise and dollar foolish. I mean, if you're hiring somebody who makes 3,000 dudhams and you expect to, to deliver a, a service, you're not. You, you know, I, I just think that we lose focus on the end game, which is the customer. Absolutely. Oh, well done, good. Thank you. Uh, any other final word? Uh, 
I'll, I'll yes. just, uh, Joy put a very, very strong statement and I totally agree with her. And I'll give a personal example, you know, my daughter works in London and I go there every two, three months. And I had this number, SIM card, which was not working. And I went to the shop, to, to the telecom operator, and I said, why is my number not working? They said, if you don't use it for 45 days, it's dead. I said, can you help me? Because all my friends, all my relatives, everybody have this number, I've circulated it. And you won't believe it. They did something, the lady there spoke to some very senior person in the head office, and the SIM card was active like this. And I shudder to think that what will happen here? I mean, I've, I've faced it. I've been buying SIM cards on and off. And it's dead, it's dead. Yes, sir, sorry, sir, we can't help you. Get lost, you no get problem, sorry, buy another sir. SIM. Yeah. What's the big deal? I mean, why do you want to retain the same number? I mean, it's so amazing yeah. in the attitude that maybe there's nothing wrong with the people and they want to help you, but the processes are we slightly don't, difficult, you know. We don't. We put so much of red tape in the processes. We don't empower our employees to make exactly, decisions. Exactly. So it's not their fault. Exactly, yeah. It's that we've trained them not to think. Yes. And that's not service. That's just servitude. That's correct. You know, I know at, at, at Fetcher, we make sure, I mean, I have it on a big wall. Um, no ma'am, no sir is not allowed. Um, because, you know, you're not, you know, I, I love the energy, and if I could, if I can say this, and I don't know how we do this collectively, everybody, and I, I mean this with sincerity. How do you make your employees proud to belong to something bigger than themselves? Because, you know, a lot of the workers that we have here who are coming in, these are the people that touch the brand. These are the people that touch you, you, this is, they don't see you sitting in a boardroom. They see these people that you pay, you know, 3,000 dirhams a month who knock on the door. How do you make these people feel proud to belong to something, to an organization that's bigger than them? You know, you know, I, at Google, you know, something that, sorry, I'm from Silicon Valley, I'm using the example, but at Google, whether you're cleaning the toilets or whether you're the lead engineer, you're proud to wear a Google t-shirt. How do you instill a sense of loyalty and dedication. So they go out and they and they they they're the ambassadors for your brand where they're like, I work, you know, I work for Jumbo. I'm 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 proud and 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 feel like they want to give their best every day because their life belongs to the company. How do you instill that? Well, you know, the thing is you you know you need to treat your your staff like your internal customers. If you don't treat them right, they're not going to be good brand ambassadors for you. So that's a very important thing. You, you know, I mean I believe in the fact that you pay peanuts, you hire monkeys, right? And, and that's the latest one. We, Lee we, we you, say that um, from you know from Singapore used to say that you need to treat your employees right. You need to pay them well, and you need to train them, train them, and train them. I I, I agree. Um, you know you have to get you have to give them incentives. You have to give them a reason to feel proud to work there. Otherwise, it's just indentured servants, right? It's, it's also hard in the mentality because here in Dubai, I noticed coming from logistics, people just want to haggle you down. Oh, 10 dirhams a delivery, 8 dirhams a delivery, 7 dirhams. Well, guess what? You're going to get a 6 dirham delivery, <laughs> you know, by somebody, you know, I, you have to up the standards and we have to up the game with logistics, with service, with all of it. And um, that's, sorry. Can I just add one, one little thing to that? Um, so, so one of the one of the big things that I think is, is is touching upon this is really, this is not something we just see in supply chain or in HR. It's something that happens across the board in in the value chain of retail. If you look traditionally in the retail value chain, it's actually a lot of the analyst companies will say it as well. They will say that like it's buy or plan, buy, uh, move, sell, uh, and then analyze. If you look at that, it's a very push driven, vendor driven kind of approach. There's nothing really customer centric about that. And that's the intimate problem of retail at the moment. And I think what is happening today in, in where customers are getting a lot more vocal, and this is what we're talking about, all these e-commerce and all these things, retail customers today actually demand to have an influence on all of these things. The retail customers, they help you decide what your buying decisions are. They want to get involved in your planning. They get involved in your supply chain because they determine whether or not you're shipping pallets or eaches. And so whenever you're talking about logistics or HR or whatever other touch point of retail, it should all be about the customer. But that's a mindset change, not just for the region, but I would argue for the whole industry. <laughs> Everybody logistics, knows. well, we, we all agree that it's that pillar of commerce without which no business can have a product to sell and generate revenue. Logistics can make or break a business. 
and no amount of investment, research and development of logistics can be said to be enough. We hope uh, everyone found this discussion and the topic interesting enough, though it may have deprived you of a quiet snooze. We thank uh, Retail Middle East for such wonderful organization bringing this panel together. We thank all the speakers for their outstanding contribution in the discussion and indeed uh, you ladies and gentlemen of the wonderful great audience. We wish you a great day and forum ahead. Thank you.